I know we're going to keep doing that even more and more. Please give it up for Mr. Chad Kendall. Um, we're not we're not shooting it, so except for over there. And then finally, last but not least, full set graduate, one of my dear friends, uh, definitely stylized dresser, um, wine connoisseur as well. Please give it up for producer and virtual production guru, Mr. Bryce D. Cristofalo. So, Thank you, sir. you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so I want to start it off by uh, asking a few questions. So we're going to break it up somewhere halfway through. Uh, Kyle's going to help us keep time and take any questions from you guys in the audience. So uh, I'll give you more drinks on that when we get there. But first, I want to start with Lou. And I want to remind the panel that this is really a uh, case study in doing a feature film, but doing it virtually. And in all honesty, uh, none of us have ever done that before. Okay? So we are learning a lot. And this is our chance to share some of the things we've learned and maybe uh, get some questions to you about things we may not have thought of. All right? So I'm going to start with Lou so she can explain what is Nine Windows? What is the story? What's it about? What was your inspiration for writing it? Hi, everybody. Um, so Nine Windows is a feature film that Hopefully someday someone will develop a robust enough environment that you could 
program and drive through a city and it will actually play out uh, through Unreal. So Chad, tell us a little bit about the development of the scenes here. Um, what does it take? What are some of the things that you have to think about? You know, your degree program is game of art, but are there differences when you're creating for volumetric production, when you're creating those environments? Uh, yes, absolutely. And of course, we're learning about them every day. Uh, you know, our degree does so much unreal work that, you know, the program came art, you know, there's lots of different things that they can get into. Like students could get into simulation or uh, previs for film for a long time has used games. And so just sort of a grasp of, of Unreal is useful in lots of different places. Um, but, you know, what you start to discover when you are dealing with kind of the volume thing was, you know, first up, which was really crazy about this, I mean, just this, to step back a little bit, I first heard the idea that this might happen in like October of 2020. Um, and then it was like a couple months later, and they're like, yeah, we're doing it. And then it was built. And so through all of those stages, we were, able, we were all having to learn exactly how it goes. Um, we're learning what kind of things, you know, Unreal, it's not just sort of taking an Unreal scene and throwing it up. You have to do very specific stuff, and you have to do all the syncing work. Uh, and luckily, I've got like an insane team that came out and jumped on and did it, Marcella. Um, over there, and Mike Cornella, and uh, Dan Hutnick's been helping with the house. Um, some of the faculty, yeah, that came on and jumped on. And and the other thing too is we had a bunch of students start to do a lot of our previews. So a lot of our early stuff to get it sort of laid out was was done by students, um, which was you know kind of one of the things that we always wanted to do. But I think it's yeah, it's an interesting thing because there's certain things that you do in games. Um, there's certain precautions that you take in games that you don't have to take here, um, especially when it comes to um, efficiencies. But then on the other side of things, you have to really, you know, slam at that sort of visual quality um, in order to make it legal. Um, and then you have to think, you know, you have to think in terms of film, which for all of us again is kind of new. Um, you have to think from the perspective of how does it look through this. Um, because coming from a game artist perspective, a lot of times you're going, well, you have to sort of consider the entire environment. You don't know the director is the player. Um, so they are controlling the camera. So the camera is you know, controlled uh, by the director. You can through it's definitely different on how you think about all this kind of stuff and how you lay out and so. I think, too, one of the things for me, uh, when I was in college, uh, I took, I had to take um, some of my graduate studies in a degree area that wasn't mine. And I took it in theater, and I was a prop master on a, a shoot, on a shoot, on a production. And you know, you, you lay all your props out, you mark them on the table, the actors know where they are, blah blah. In this, we um, Lou and Bryce went and chopped the props, and we had to give images of those to Gay Mark. They had to replicate them in the digital universe so that uh, if we have a shot where the kitchen is in the background, but we're not seated in the kitchen, we're seated in the living room, then all those kitchen things have to be, that they may touch later when we are in the kitchen, have to be in the background, right? So a lot of thought has to go into everything, like is there a plant on the side table? Is there a lamp there? Is the actor gonna touch it? Is there a book? Is there a knife? You know, all these things have to really be uh, thought through. And then we have to make critical decisions on what we're going to replicate, right? What's going to be touched, what's not going to be touched, what's just going to be background. And then even in things like sh like shots, like this shot, um, we'll show you a little bit later, but it starts with almost a lens reveal uh, from this real piece here and scoots across. And you have to think too, well, if I'm going to shoot on one side of a set of bookshelves, am I later going to shoot from the other side where the bookshelves have to be virtual? Right, so you have the real ones and you have the virtual ones. So it's a lot of thought that has to go into that. And um, Lou, I'm just going to get out something. I'm going to come back to you in a minute and ask you about the challenges and have to rethink your, sh your shooting and your shooting style. But Bryce, I want to ask you, what in this, um, in this script caused you to think about wholesale? Because um, Bryce is the producer uh, on this film. And uh, why did you think this would be the place to produce this film? 
Um, no, think about that for a second. Uh, well, multiple reasons, of course. You know, we were discussing about what this technology was and where the business was going, which I want to cut up on as a part of the idea. Hollywood used to do this. The studio system was inside of studios, right? right. So old Hollywood was built on these ideas, and like you said, theater, right? So, ironically enough, I got into this very early, but it also made sense because I played video games. So then, when we started discussing the fact that you guys were doing it, I came out here, right? I saw what was technically an empty room. <laughs> none, of the, none of this was built. Um, but I also thought because of what Full Sail and I was here, right? And I knew, I'm not sure I said about giving back, but Full Sail gave me so many tools and so much, I'd say honestly, love and respect that I knew this would be a great opportunity to not only bring something back to the university, but this was an opportunity for everyone here, right? To start working in this, which is the future of this business. I mean, 110%. So if you can get into that, I mean, even just for a day, right? To start understanding this. You are so far ahead of so many people out there. So really, it was a mutually beneficial opportunity, not just for everyone here, but for everyone here right now. It's looking at this and just starting to understand what's being done in front of you. So that was really best my thought, right? Was this was a producer-friendly script, right? Uh, we weren't doing Transformers or something, you know. There was no big pyro. I mean, there was other things I thought about when it came to logistics of bringing this project here specifically, because yes, it was a project that we could, of course, there's a lot of time and effort we put into this whole deal, but it could be achievable, right? And it was something that if we were gonna to work together on, we could actually do it. And when I, I don't know, can we actually still say this is the first fully done film? I'm pretty sure we're gonna beat everybody. I think we'd have to do some research on that. Yeah. I know there was a short that was put out. The short, yeah. The virtual, but as far as a full feature, yeah. uh, it will definitely be one of the first full features done as virtual. And that was the thing I, I so appreciate Lou because the fact that as a director and writer, you know, it's kind of hard to take the vision you have and put it in the box as weird as virtual is. You can't say as small because it's actually a much bigger box, but when it comes to having to work around uh, how the environment needs to be translated into camera, it becomes a little bit difficult. For example, this is only one half of the basement because the other half is out there where you're sitting in the game engine. So we really need to shoot everything on this side of it first. And then if we have shots that go the other way, we literally would take this lighting and put it over there and shoot the other lighting, right? So it's not, uh, it's not a difficult turnaround, but it's not as easy as just flipping the environment, there's a lot of other technical aspects that have to actually happen. Uh, and so that's different for a director to have to deal with because sometimes their shots are lined up by when the actors available. Or is this a day shot? Or is this a night shot? Right? Or is there movement in the shot involved? Because we don't, you know, let's rent the gym for one day instead of 10 days and do all those shots, right? So we don't get those kind of luxuries. We have to think about well, what's our setup time to, re to change the environment. So in this shoot, I think it's pretty safe to say, I know we have scenes where we probably will come back to this, but this is mostly our first week and I'm gonna to move to the house. And then you have a car scene, a process scene in there. And then do we come back to the, come back to the basement at the end? Right? Yeah. And a lot of that is around actor, really, right? Because we have, how many of you know who William Forsyth is? One hand, there we go. All right, how old are you, 40? Oh, there he is. That's right here. The joke. I actually ordered this shirt online for this purpose. Raising Arizona. Very well uh, film, actually. Um, and then Michael Bray, who was in Hope Floats, uh, any of the cruisers, that's Dave Franco's favorite movie. Um, I'm missing one that was really good. Oh, uh, Philadelphia Experiment. Streets of Fire. Streets of Fire. Any of these movies? Right? No. Right. You got <laughs> Same hand. Same hand. All right. Excellent. Yeah, it's definitely the 90s, but these are really, this is groundbreaking for Full Sail because I mean, I think the best we could ever claim was Larry the Cable Guy and Rob Schneider, right? So we're up, we're early up in the game here. 
Like totally. Uh, and those guys are great, uh, but yeah, this is gonna be cool. Uh, Mo, I wanna ask you, what's it like DPing in the, a virtual space? Like what, what's hard about it, what's great about it? Um, I don't wanna steal your thunder, but Kyle pulled me over just a little while ago to look at the reflection in this grill back here. It's reflecting the ceiling. And um, if we were on a sound stage, we probably wouldn't get that. We'd see all the lights and everything. Uh, but in this environment, we keep the lights way out there to just use this fill and have actual reflections of the environment in, in the set. Uh, I joke, so let's paint this gold, let's paint that silver, let's you know, really do the reflections. But tell us a little bit about what you found um, is really great about shooting virtual from a DP standpoint, and then what do you think some of the challenges are? Um, well, one of the things is that uh, I guess that the closest uh, comparison you can do with virtual is, is, is actually green screen. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, you know the uh, pretty much uh, virtual sets is an evolution I think of green screen. So what you just mentioned, having that reflection on the grill uh, will be hard to do on a green screen set, for instance. Uh, you're gonna have to move so many elements around, and uh, now that just comes because you have a top panel who is actually reflecting what on the set is the, the ceiling. So those are the, the natural, easy things uh, and you know beneficial for us. Uh, we don't have to think twice when we design our shots. The challenging parts are, well, we just getting, getting into this um, way of uh, making movies. So I'm gonna start and find out what, what, what those uh, challenges are, but with the test that we did, um, um, what I'm finding uh, right now is uh, how to uh, expose the characters and the background uh, and, and make the changes uh, quick. So I'm taking a new approach now. I'm exposing for the characters and then adjusting the, the background on the computer and then also you have to link with the lights with the with the lights that I would say and the practical lights. So I guess that's what the challenge is how to match all these worlds uh, together, how to stitch them. Uh, but that's something that I'm discovering now. Um, some of the good things is that you can do a scouting location for instance, you know, just wearing a headset, a virtual headset and um, find uh, camera positions, uh, camera movements ahead of time and have a conversation uh, with the director uh, about uh, blocking the camera and you know. So all of that stuff um, I guess is beneficial because uh, you know, it keeps you ahead of the game. Uh, we, yesterday we actually were doing uh, some kind of animatic uh, with one of the cameras and we could find a lot of uh, problems that we can now address it uh, quickly. So uh, that's beneficial as well. The lighting, you know, everybody's thinking like, okay, you don't need to light anymore because you have these panels, which is true. These uh, panels give you a lot of the base light uh, that you will need, uh, but you still need to make some adjustments uh, anyways. But I will say 60% of the lighting is already coming from the, from the panels and the rest uh, of lighting you have to do is just accent some objects like this light I put over there to create a little accent on these uh, um, you know, boxes uh, that will match uh, the background. Um, some of the, uh, those are some of the beneficial things as, as well. So, um, you know, we are uh, exploring all of this to be honest with, uh, with you guys. Uh, I guess we're ready for any other uh, challenge that we present and uh, we'll have to overcome. Um, I'm relying on great people uh, here that have a, a lot of knowledge on the engine and uh, a lot of knowledge on the, how to work with the graphics on the computer and how to make those changes there. So um, I, I feel pretty confident about making this film and making it look uh, good. Good, because that makes me feel good. <laughs> Um, Lou, basically, you know, the same question, but from a director's perspective, what have you found to be uh, some of the challenges with working in a virtual environment? I had a lot of um, experience with uh, limited, 
locations. Like most of my films, because of budget, it are you know limited locations. Um, so that part, it's like an interesting transition for me. Um, how to keep the story interesting when the road happens mostly in this one house. Um, but the issue, some of the shots I want to do, we couldn't do, you know, and it, it, I'm a little bummed about it, to be honest, because um, it would help greatly to build up that suspense. One of the per perfect example is this um, scene where she is in her bedroom and she hears a noise in the, in the living room and she has to walk through this dark uh, hallway to get there. And I originally had an idea of like having a Dutch angle you know, her walking down the hallway and, you know, and then it's like, well, no, we only have one wall, we have two walls. So she can't walk down the hallway. She could start to walk towards the opening, but that, that's it, you have to cut there because, she, you know, she can't walk in between two walls. Um, so that, I'm really bummed about not being able to do that one. Um, so it, it limits you in that respect, you know, but, but at the same time, if we had to, if we were shooting in real life, I, I've never shot in a studio, you know, the typical studio environment um, where you would have to build, you know, a set that is built that I can only imagine how much that would cost. Um, where you can move walls, you know, so you can, so you never have to move this stuff around because you just move the walls to create, you know, where you shoot from. But in real life, uh, we would have had to have three different locations. Or and we would have, one of them would have been you know filming outside and it's an accident outside so how do you do that you know without it costing I don't know hundreds of thousands of dollars and stopping traffic and police escorts and all that stuff um, so that right there that I couldn't have done that shot in real life um, and and then you have you know the basement there's so many spooky basements everywhere, so that, that would have been easy to do. But you know, have a house that fits exactly your idea when you're writing. I created this great room where like all, everything was interconnected, you know, the, the living room, the place where she's working on uh, her computer and her um, um, dining room. So I mean, how many houses would I have had to go and look that would have had all that and look exactly how I needed to? Um, in other ways, it would have been easier because Let's say I'm doing um, a scene between me and Mo, and I'm doing it over the shoulder of him, and I don't know, to, and I reverse over the shoulder. We have to really think about it, because really, mostly you have one wall. These walls are curved and a little bit trickier. So you have to not, you have to position it in a way so that you don't basically have to turn around the entire set to make that happen. So instead of a strict, over, over the shoulder, we're probably doing more of it over here, so you get that back. As opposed, you know, we have to, or we have to cheat it a little bit, you know, um, move them a little bit and make it look like, you know, this is the background. So it's stuff like that that I've never had to think of in a in a real set. Um, and then, from what I've seen from the the stuff that we did in January and so on. The background can look very much like a video game sometimes if you don't put stuff in the background to build that. Um, and so, how to do that on a close up? How do you, I mean, I, yeah, what we're going to do here is very easy because we start behind those boxes and already you've built that, you know, that depth. But how do you do that on a close up or a medium close up, you know? Um, you, you can't always just have a, a plant just in front of your face, you know? So, it's um you know one of the things that I I'm, I'm not in your shoes I, I I'm certainly more as a producer uh, mostly on the full set side but I will say it's hard sometimes to look at the story just as the story and how to tell the story the best way to actually tell the story and not feel a little bit of loss on some of those storytelling conventions, like push-pulls, which we can do. Um, actually, we can do them very effectively. But as uh, Lou was pointing out, in order for us to do a two-walled hallway with cameras out there, and there's a wall here and a wall here, we literally have to build the walls, right? 
which so it, it can be done, but it's a huge budget expense, producer talking, for one shot, right? So that's, I think, sometimes the things that you have to think about from a producer standpoint, but also the virtual side, is where are some of those um, things that we might have to let go just for the sake of budget. And they mostly come down to how many times we're gonna use that prop, right, before we buy it. How many times is that gonna appear in the scene? Uh, can we do something else? The flip side of that, being at full sale, I really want to show off the technology. You know, I want, uh, I wish we had a gym in here, you know, where we could do these really sweeping gym shots and things like that. Um, I wish we had the uh, money in the, in the full sale budget to buy smart lenses so that we can do uh, changing focal lights, you know, zooms on the fly. And in that situation, the lens configurations are relayed directly into the game engine. Here, if we change this lens, we have to update the game engine and tell them what focal length that we're using. So it's the easier way to do it from a teacher standpoint. It's what I want my teachers to know, or my students to know, because it's the base level. You better know how to do that um, before we get into the higher end of interfacing the lens into the game engine. Uh, but someday, we'll get there, and then we'll find that overcome some of these things that Lou uh, is, is talking about. Um, Kyle, where are we at on the time frame? You around? Kyle? No? Okay. What's that? What, where are we at on the time? Oh, you're doing fine. You've got six more minutes before it's a half hour. All right, six more minutes before it's a half hour. Let me ask the panel, is there anything else that you would want to contribute to your experience so far uh, that you think would be something that our students here would want to know or be interested in? Just to add a little bit about what Lou was saying with the example of the over-the-shoulder shots that we do so much in the, uh, you know, in the regular uh, shoots uh, at school. Uh, I think uh, the, the challenging part for me was to wrap my head around something that I don't see, like she was saying, you know. Uh, an over-the-shoulder can become so simple for the traditional work that we, we used to shoot. And now, uh, you really have to think about eye lines and the direction of the of, of the action um, more you know you gotta be more aware of that, that, that kind of stuff so if you're in the camera department uh, uh, you know that you know eye, line, eye lines and the, the line of action and that continuity is also your responsibility so um, i guess this technology is going to keep us all you know, on our toes you know yes. as far as that goes you know like because to be honest with you, I'm not really bad at that. I'm a camera operator, but you know, it always like take me about five seconds when they ask me where the actor was looking, so I have to kind of think. But I get answer after five seconds. Now it's gonna be even, you know, even, even more complicated. But uh, it's all a mental game, you know. It's, 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 it's that. So. Okay. I mean, from a directing point of view, I I say that a lot of work because. You know, normally I would do I would do a shot list maybe a month before. I had to do it like what like six months ago. So it was way more pre-production than I've ever done in film. I mean, way more. Um, and just you know, normally it's like okay, you know, um, our department you take care of this, whatever. Like so many things about like okay, what do you want to be on and on, on, you know on the stage and. And having to think of what is real, what what, the cat, what do people actually touch, so you know they need to recreate all that stuff. It has been so much more work than I would normally do on a, on a production. Um, but I could definitely, maybe not so much in a film like this, because this is a pretty simple, you know, plot. But I can definitely see that if you're doing something. That's a you know I don't know you're shoot, you're shooting in a desert or something like that like this is so much better than having to go shoot in a desert you know last film like, that I shot we shot in the Florida Everglades it was hot we were sweating our asses off there was mosquitoes everywhere I've never had so many mosquito bites all over I that would be great but it was shot on the stage so I mean I definitely think that for certain productions this is so far better. It's just the amount of pre-planning and, and thinking of just every little detail 
because you can't make a decision of a shot, of adding a shot right on the spot, like, you know, like I would normally do. You have to pre-plan every shot that needs to be planned on the, on the game uh, engine. Um, I mean, you can add, but it, it just, it would take a lot longer to do than if, you, if it's already pre-planned. You can talk about how long it takes to plan too. No, it, it's a lot of planning. I don't um, know how many of you have researched, you know, some of the things that are going on. I'm realist publishing stuff all the time. There's people, there's a whole glossary that came out last month on terminology for Unreal Production or for, um, for virtual production. One of the terms is previs. So in our previs uh, part, which a lot of that stuff would happen in post, if we were to shoot all this on a green screen and then uh, and put it all in later. In previs is where we have all the development for all of our environments and bring them into the volume and put them up on the screen and moving into tech biz where we actually are trying to figure out our camera shots, what the lighting needs to be to adjust everything uh, to make it work with the environment. And so these are new um, layers to the production process, right? So what was in the back end has now moved to the front end, and what was uh, maybe a visual effects and an editor's uh, role has now become the director's uh, responsibility, unfortunately, because all those decisions have to be made. Um, a lot of other things, how many of you are into art direction? Anybody? Okay. So just a word of advice, get Unreal and start learning how to use it. Um, you can go to the Unreal Marketplace, or you can go to like CD Trader. There's tons of places you can buy environments, and they are ridiculously cheap. Um, and some are free. And the only thing you want to look for is you know the resolution of it, uh, making sure that it's good quality, especially if it's going to be for virtual production. If you go to the Unreal Marketplace, they're actually siloed into gaming, virtual production. You can find stuff there. And use your film background because there's lights and there's things like specular reflection qualities, things like that. Um, use some of that knowledge and watch the tutorials that are free as well. If you can get into Unreal Fellowship, another boost right there. And I'm telling you this because there's a real need for art direction or virtual artists or virtual art directors, which Marcella is for our production. Uh, here, so she supervises all of these uh, elements that go in. There needs to be a single bond on that, and there's just not anybody out there who can do it. I, I hope we haven't over equipped Marcella that we lose her to uh, some other uh, ILM or something, but um, it's definitely a skill that is needed. I'm going to say this, and I'm, I'm going to be cautious about it, but a large, very large studio opened here either last week or the week before that's virtual twice maybe three times the size of this stage looking to produce feature films did their ribbon cutting did their grand opening had no environment artists at all and everyone was like that's just a big green screen because they couldn't understand the technology because they didn't have the artist behind it right so there's just a huge need and i will tell you that facility would probably pay six figures to have an artist right now. Yeah, because they can A, afford it, and B, or have the half hour And B, um, there's just such a need, okay? And you guys in Game Mart, you are so well equipped. Uh, you just need to understand a little bit more about film. And those of you in film, you understand the principles of lighting. You understand about reflection, and color, uh, and color theory. So you use that knowledge. All right, so we're gonna to move to questions. So here's the thing. You have Blue, you have Mo, you have Chad, you have Bryce, you have me. Um, we also have Marcella, like I said, who is our virtual art director. And we have Kyle, who is the uh, manager for this facility. If you wanna direct a question to any of us, please just say, this is a question for Lou, or if it's a question for the group, just say it's for the group. So at least we know who's supposed to be Respond to that. Now that doesn't mean you can't respond. Bryce always talks a lot. So we don't have to worry about him filling in the gaps. Because he will. But uh, let's go ahead and do that. Kyle, where are you at? Can I hand you this mic and then you just, yeah. as hands go up, just give them a, and then we'll just pass it. 100%. Okay. 
or something. Okay, that makes me in charge of who gets to ask the questions. All right, so I guess we'll, we'll, we'll start right here. Wait, wait. Okay, hey, oh, you asked a question earlier that I said we had answered. Did we answer it? Um, yes, actually, you did answer, but I have another one now. So, uh, for everybody that's here, by the way, I'm Rachel Lindsay. I am a film major, but I want to get my filthy hands on everything. So, um, what I was wondering is for each department, I understand that anything is possible, but not everything is cost effective or doable in a set amount of time. So at what point in your department do you realize that you just have to scrap the idea? Yeah, I, I can start with this one because I, there was one pretty early where I was like, mm -hmm. um, and that had to do with the city. So there's some shots where um, they're driving through the city and um, it's important, really important, but it's relatively short. And so based on the fact that we had sort of a small amount of people we were like, hey, in order to build the city and move the camera through with NSYNC, with the, you know, the way it's set up is messy. Um, and cities have people walking in, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the city that's like ultra complex. And so I was like, okay, that's gonna be really nasty. And there's a way that we can figure out another way to do that that would be ideal. These other places are more static. And so the, you know, the focus is on the actors, but in the city there's a lot of stuff going on. So that was kind of one of the ones that I was, Pretty early on, I was like a little uh, nervous about that. And even the crash we've been back and forth on, but I was working on it today. Um, <laughs> I'm working on the crash so that it's virtual um, because it's relatively quick and I think we can kind of get away with that. But if we are driving around the city, there would be a lot of stuff. Unless it was like extremely, um, you know, blurry in the background or something like that, we're not really here. But that was one where I was like, that seems more trouble than all this other stuff, which is really necessary. I think for me as a producer, you know, the producer is always thinking about your bottom line and I'm a little bit different than Bryce's bottom line because Bryce is more about the production and its abilities, you know, score points and make funds, and get uh, backers and distribution, all that's in his side. On my side, it's really about full sales investment. What do we, what do we gain out of it? So we always are looking to, my bullet points are always how many students gonna get involved, how many grads are you gonna hire, what's the PR value, right? To me, the highest PR value was this production is 100% virtual. And then we came to the realization 98% is probably a better, is more realistic. Because to Chad's point, even though we could technically call it virtual, our solution is to take a high-res 5K uh, camera and drive through Orlando and then drive back and then have the, the shots that we can put up on the screen. One of the reasons we have a flat wall here is so that we can play video without worrying about the curve distortion, distortion and just shoot at it as a background. There is a scene where there's fire involved and we just couldn't see that happening in here. There's three million dollars invested in here, and I know that our safety guy is not gonna let us put a fire in here. So we had to compromise with that. It has to be shot realistically with a real fire and grill to contain the fire. Uh, so it's a little bit of a bummer. We can't really claim 100% virtual, but we can claim significant majority of this will be virtual. So that was my give up. So back to that same question you asked about why we bring this here, right? Well, there's another reason as well, and that's because this is a real movie in a real place. So 90% of what's being produced on these kind of walls is fantasy land, right? Meaning, again, everyone's familiar with Mandalorian, right? Everybody here? Hello? Yeah. 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 All right, all right. All right, you guys ever seen Star Wars, right? So Star Wars movies? Yeah. yeah. All right, so now, Think about two scenes. You've ever seen some assuming Empire Strikes Back, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We've all seen now the, well, the Force Awakens, the new one, right? Your re re reboot. Yeah. Okay. Now, two scenes, really easy to cover. We have two scenes right by each other. We have Kylo Ren yelling at Harrison Ford's on Solo, right? They're on the scaffolding, right? Those reverse shots, angles. That's all done on a green screen, right? Now you go back to Luke, right? And Darth Vader, and get his hand cut off. Look at those scenes together. Which one looks more real in your mind's eye? Which one? Just say it out loud. Empire Strikes Back, right? Okay. 
That was done on rear projection. This technology is the same thing, just in a different idea. The difference is, of course, how that camera communicates, right, through AR. I mean, this world, you're actually sitting on the other side. Okay. So back to the importance of doing this film, specifically, was because this is a real place. We have a house. We can trick people in the real world, not, I don't know, tattooing in a bar. Which, by the way, is very impressive. You guys see behind the scenes on that. When I saw the fact that the bar was not there, I was like, even the bar isn't real? So that's the other reason why I do this project because the importance of it. If we were doing this on the moon, everyone knows we're on the moon. But if you can watch a trailer, you can go, wait a second, those people are never in a house? Then we've all done our jobs, 110%. So yes, we can say that. Thank you, guys. All right, so the next question. Oh, a little far away. All right. Here you go. Um, this question is for the group, but how has the job of script supervisor changed with the advent of the wall? <laughs> you want to be one? Yes. Um, how does it change? Well, like when he was talking about the about about uh, the eyeline and all that, it's the same thing with not crossing the line, right? Um, it's now since now. You're literally flipping the set. You have to remember which shot, which side you shot from, to redo that because otherwise you're going to be crossing the line constantly. Um, and we realize that because you know, I, if you guys don't use this this um, program, it's called Shot Designer. It's twenty bucks. Best thing to to design your shots if you're if you're a director. Um, and it's very easy on a piece of paper to say, okay, these are two over shoulders. But when then when Mo and I were sitting around like planning the shots and going through them, it's like, oh crap, that would mean moving, you know, moving the entire set. So we're not gonna be able to do those back to back. It's better that we do all the shots from this side. And then when we flip it around, then you do all the shots from, from this person's side. And we're gonna we're gonna have to be very mindful that we're not crossing the line when we do that. And even though those scenes are going to be shot, that same scene is going to be shot hours apart. So, good luck. <laughs> you're, gonna have to, you're gonna have to take a lot of pictures so you remember how that scene that you shot hours ago looked. Uh, and you're gonna have to have really good memory and like, and keep it in, in your mind of like, okay, hold on, let's not cross the line. So we may have to make sure that we shoot it over this shoulder because otherwise we're crossing the line and we shoot over this shoulder. But you know, normally on a set, that would literally, you shoot one, you shoot the other one right after. So, I mean, if you're a half decent, um, you know, uh, scripty, you gotta remember that. Try hours later. Yeah, also too, with um, a lot of times that you guys know, in filmmaking, uh, especially if it's more video, we would put multiple cameras on set. So we would have, you know, one camera for one actor, uh, OTS, with the other camera on the other side, OTS, looking at each other, and the camera's just out of frame. We can't do that here. And the reason we can't do that here is because while the camera's communicating with the game engine, the game engine's creating the thrust them. And you can't have two frustums unless you have two independent tracking systems uh, for those cameras. And while this is a phenomenally large um, uh, virtual studio, I mean, some of the some of the studios in the country, professional, are either this size or not quite this big. Um, it's not large enough, really, for two cameras without the frustums colliding. And I don't even know, want to think what the game engine would do when that started to happen. Uh, and then the other thing, um, to lose point, just to explain the technology a little bit, this shape that you see here um, is governed in the game engine by something called in display. And so what we do is we uh, put the virtual camera in position where it's only looking at the environment as it's going to be displayed on the screen. And so, as Lou is pointing out, when we switch, we have to switch that, we have to switch that perspective. So we either flip the environment or we flip the in-display around in the environment. 
And then continuity is really about, did we get the right edge? Are we flipped enough? You know, are we at the real 180 degrees uh, for, the, for this next shot or, or are we missing something, right? And then think two shadows and things like that. You have a staircase here. Um, if we were shooting where the staircase was along the back and we flipped the other way, was that creating a shadow? Because now we don't see it in the shot, but was there a shadow that's supposed to fall from that space? There's a lot of little things like that that people think about. Maybe a practical solution for that. Sounds funny, but I have to create a mock. You know, like we have a virtual set and we can get a headset and get into the, the, the graphics, the, the environment. But I guess it will be helpful, uh, like you were saying, like check out your uh, your plot. I had to create a mock in order to you know wrap my head around all the flipping things. So um, how the the work of the script supervisor uh, changes? Well, that is I'm more aware of that, that kind of stuff. You know, because it's easy to lose track when things were to the left, now are on the right, and then we can look at that together. So. If, if, since this is so new, if you follow that path and you become a script supervisor, you don't want to be one of a handful of script supervisors that knows what the hell they're doing in this environment, so you'll be very sought after and it'll be a great career and you'll make tons of money. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a good thing because now I think I'm only projecting, but I think a new script supervisor would be very close to your environment artist and actually write down coordinates four sets, um, uh, certain elements like focal lengths, frame rates, because we sometimes will adjust them in the game engine. Most of the time we try not to. We try to stay in the camera world because we know that world a lot better. And sometimes the game engine's like, I don't know what the heck you're doing, but I ain't doing that. You know, and, and you saw weird things. But some, it really helps to have those. We had an incident where we were uh, working with the airplane hangar and I made a comment, I think we should do this. We did that and the plane went black and we couldn't get back because we, don't remember, we didn't remember what it was we, we needed to do that. So basically the A's had to go back and re-light that plane because we had lost what, with a keystroke, we had lost a, a big part of that. So continuity could fold into whatever the game engine settings are for the scene as well. Um, I haven't reached a level of production where that's been thought through, maybe we'll stay with the game artists, I don't know, but it's certainly something to think about. All right, are you guys good? More questions? More questions, we've got questions. So in the back, back yeah. in the front. Yeah, a lot. A lot. Hi, my name is Alex, and I, I think I have a question for the whole group. Um, we've talked a little bit about script supervisor stuff, but what are some of the main changes in workflow and discipline for our other below-the-line workers, like camera assistants, scripts, PAs, working on a, a set like this versus something more traditional? Oh, wow. I, I will say one of the things we need definitely help with is changeover. You gotta, you know, when you flip a scene, if you took the scene and flipped it, then all these props have to go the other direction if they're gonna be in the shot. Uh, the lights have to go to the other side if they're gonna be in the shot. And those things aren't just pick it up. I mean, Mo can speak more to this. There's probably measurements that have to go in place there. So uh, there's a lot of little details that will have to be done uh, on a flip. So uh, what else? What else? Yeah, and it's related also to uh, script supervising. You have to take much more notes as a second assistant camera, for instance. Uh, camera height, camera distance, object distances, so everything can match uh, together. Um, so that's the job also of a script supervisor. Uh, as far as discipline goes, you know, what I see here is like now we are attached to a cord. Uh, so that's not something that we will do on film much. Uh, so moving the camera, for instance, is, a, is a, a different game. We gotta be careful not to uh, disconnect uh, you know, cables that shouldn't be disconnected because then we have more work on the other end. Um, being aware of the safety, now we have to move in. These, these panels are super expensive, you know, and we, we move camera fast usually. So we gotta get a bit more discipline on that too. We don't wanna damage uh, these panels because then we are to shoot for the day, for instance. 
uh, and stuff like that. Um, anything else um, is, you know, is, is, is pretty standard. Uh, we add more, one more accessory on the camera. If you look on the top of the camera, we have like a, the, the, the tracker. So that's something that has been thrown on our plate as well as uh, no part of our camera equipment. So we have to now definitely be more disciplined with that kind of stuff that we you know, we love you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, more hands up. What do we got? Sorry, I'm sorry. Hi, um, oops. Uh, my name is Emily, uh, and I wanted to know, like, you know, Lou said that she had to make, like, artistic decisions, like, in pre-production and uh, mostly as, like, environmental artists. How like the production designer roles plays here? Or, like, how does it work? And what falls under the director's shoulders? I don't know. Yeah. So are you asking, just to be clear, you're talking from like art direction design? Uh, rephrase that. You said like two things. And from the director's point of view, how the design of the environment is? Or? Um, like, First thing is like how the role of production designer works with like that yeah. technology yeah. and what falls under the director's shoulders, like on reproduction design and like what goes. Uh, so yeah, that's actually been happening in real time as we're doing this. No, no, no. I thought I was projecting it. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, see? So, um, so now, like I said, everything, it, it's the same process. If you go to storyboards, right? It's just, it's just the same thing. You have a board, right? And we were talking about previous beforehand. Um, even there's companies in this, the third, the third floor, right? You guys know the previous stuff? Oh, and this is an interesting question. There is a company that spends, I'm talking out of these companies, big, big studios, three to four million dollars just to make a digital animatic cartoon of a movie you go see. So the production design team, the director, can technically watch a cartoon movie before they actually make it. So now when it comes to the production designer's point of view, communicating with the director, it's, it's still our department. That's what we're talking about, the workflow. The workflow has kind of been flipped, right? You do have those elements in the beginning stage of the, on the timeline here. So in the beginning stage, you are gonna have your art department, right? Putting together your sketches, paintings, whatever it's gonna be, of what the look of this is going to be, right? You then have kind of an Unreal or UI team that's going to then building those environments, right? And those really, if they're going in the gaming department, there are really three major, major jobs out there, what Rick was saying. You need an architect, okay? You guys like architect and design, and uh, the gaming people here, that is super important. It's also production design, right? If you can understand what he said, go and get the system. If you can figure out how to start working with it and understand from just that perspective, Plot it by building a city, building a house, building whatever. Then you have lighting. So your lighters, whoever loves lighting in here, is so important. That's how things become realistic, is light. So it's important things lumens. So the third thing are modelers. If anyone in high school said, I don't know, build that box. Great. Build a rocket ship. Uh, build this chair. Those are the three most important components of people. Also the design team, production design that are part of the system, because then you, you have to build all of that before you get here. And in, in the interim, the director is sending, again, mood boards, right, ideas, what they're thinking about. You said the house, right? We literally just said, here are the photos of houses we talked about that we liked, right, from an aesthetic point of view. Then we go into Chad's team, obviously went into then designing or bringing in elements that we were going, oh, that looks great, that makes sense. And to be quite honest, the fun part is, you kind of do whatever you want. That's why they call it Unreal Engine, right? That was the whole joke, it's, it's Unreal. You know, that was then the guys that were going, oh, that's right, we can just create whatever we want for these gaming tournament games, right? Unreal Tournament was <laughs> the game. So you can go anywhere, right? You can do anything. So technically, it is a process, but it is a highly achievable process once the math problem's there. Because this is, this is science. This is, I mean, there is artistry here, but this is a lot of science. You gotta have art, you gotta have that vision, you gotta have that magic. But this is a, this is, this is a math problem. So if you can understand the math problem, we're gonna say, and there is a finite space. I think you in the back are asking about how does that affect the other departments, right? We're talking about like people on set? Yeah. Okay, there's not gonna be as many jobs, right? Because you can figure this out just by looking around. 
you've been, as, I'm assuming anyone has been in actual production, you can go to a production and have 60 people there. Even have 100. What are, what are most of those people doing during the day? Those are the, the expressions, hurry up and wait. And here, we work. We're literally moving around because we're all here. Now it becomes finite, right? Because this is the important factor, this is the truth. You start to master this system, you become extremely important very quickly, and it will affect those jobs. And actually, in the business that we were all talking about, people were scared of this. This terrified some people. It, yeah, because they're gonna go, oh wait, I, you don't need me as much anymore? And you'll be like, no, we don't need you as much anymore, unfortunately, but fortunately, right? So this is, again, something that if you learn it, I want to add something. Uh, Bryce was talking about previs, uh, and I mentioned it earlier. So, for a long time, previs has existed in the film world, and it was run from people that sort of knew game engine experience. Um, and you can see this stuff all the time. You know, you think of the Marvel movies, you'll see these like rudimentary Iron Man flying around. Um, it's basically they want to be able to make really quick changes. And what would it look like if it's raining right now? And those are the things you could do in an engine, not the rain. So you could go in there and do these sort of quick things. Previs is sort of what gave birth to this, because as the engines improved, and the screen technology improved, um, it started to, to be like, hey, we can make this look almost as good as you know you want to see it. And and then they started shooting it, and it, you know, um, they started getting better and better and saying, I think we can just sort of go final pixel, what they call this. Um, and so, you know, that's those are areas. Um, of jobs like Bryce was talking about that are another sort of piece of the puzzle. You, a lot of times you might have a pre team and then you might have the final pixel team that's all a part of the virtual art department. And like you said, it's, you're going to have modelers, you're going to have lighters, you're going to have um, on-set TVs like, like we've been, our folks have been doing. Um, so there's a bunch of opportunities on the, on the 3D graphics side of things to get into film. And so it's not just sort of a, oh, I make, you know, I went to game art and so I make games. No, I mean, you could make games for six months and then you could go, you know, work on the film. Um, it's using the same technology. So it's definitely, um, you know, get in on it. It's free and learn it as much as you can for your. I think the, the better answer to your question in terms of just production designers is that you're going to be involved way sooner than you ever were before, like months in advance. Um, and then once you make a decision, which a lot of, you know, I imagine, I'd be honest, I've never worked with a production site before. So I, I, I can only imagine the kind of stuff that you guys work on, um, that you, you're working with the director and saying, what do you want it to look like? Um, but once you make, you know, once you make a decision and it's, and it's created for this world, it's not like you can be on set and say, you know, all right, that's, no, that doesn't look good, whatever. It's already, put into an environment and to re-render the entire scene without just that one little piece is a, it's a pain in the butt. So you don't want to do that. So you'll, you, you'll start working on production way earlier than you ever did before. Yeah, I know this is, uh, this is an important question, but I want to just kind of use it to get everybody to understand. There are a lot of traditional jobs, production designers one, art directors another, scenics, uh, in the film industry. Do they go away? I, I don't think they go away. I think they, they change. So for example, a scenic artist is really in virtual going to be an environmentalist. Environment artist is what they're going to be, right? So you have someone designing the basement, you have someone designing the house. Um, the production designer would still be the production designer. That would be the person that checks off and says, I like it, that's going to work. And they directly consult with the director to make sure the director likes it, right? So you're still going to have that. Where your art dogs are going to be is still focused more on props, furniture elements, if they have to build something that doesn't exist anymore, like an antique harpsichord or something. Um, those people are still going to be doing those builds. But we're going to find less of building massive sets and more of building insert pieces. Like in this, in this production, there is a front door to this house. Well, they're not going to come through the screen. So we have to build a door, and we have to make it blend into the environment. Someone's coming down the staircase. So we actually have a staircase, and this one, the artist created based on the one that we actually have, so we don't have to rebuild a new staircase. So 
the production design would say, we need a staircase that works, decide what that's gonna look like, have the environmental artist create it, or we've gone the other way, have the art dogs create it and build it, uh, and then give those snapshots to the environmentalists and then they put it into the virtual side, right? So there's a lot going on and I, I can't say that we can tell effectively where the dust is gonna settle on these positions, but we can say that the value points are in understanding the virtual side and how it relates to the real world uh, to make you in line for that superior production designer that can go back and forth between those two departments. And that's the last thing I'll say. There's probably going to be two departments now um, under production designer in, that'll be virtual and then also real. And the real will have less to do and the virtual will have more to do. That was a great question and some great answers from our panelists. We are running short on time though. So um, we're going to do a demo real quick, yeah? Yeah, so let, I'm gonna, let's give it up for the panelists. I'm going to ask them to do it. And uh, is there any chairs with them? Okay. Is there any chairs with them on the set? Uh, or they can just say set them on the wall. Oh, you're going to do it then? One of you guys can stay up here and the rest of you guys can head out. Okay. okay. I'll say, yeah, just take those, just take those things out. Um, thank you. So what we want to show you now, real quick, while they're setting up, is if you haven't seen it before, and if you saw it with the airplane, with the ribbon cutting, the airplane, now it's the same idea, but different. So before they, before you start moving, back it up, Mom. Yeah, the way <laughs> this, the way this technology works, if you look up in the ceiling, you see all these white dots. Those are infrared reflectors, and um, Ace was pointing to this little piece on top of the camera. And Mo was referring to it. That's our infrared camera. It reads infrared reflection off of those reflectors. And just like stars, it plots where this camera is and its rate of movement in relationship to those reflectors. Does that make sense? All right, so that's all the shift to it. We take all that data, we put it in the game engine, and inside the game engine is this environment with a replica camera. That camera is the same distance focal length as this camera, and that camera takes those coordinates and moves along with this one, and what it sees gets put up into the first one. And that's what gives us the realism. Now, what's really cool about this is that's a 3D environment, which means that there is a foreground, a background, and a midground. If we were to just put a piece of, of, of uh, image up here, like a, a still image or video, it would be flat because it's not three-dimensional. It's a representation of three dimensions, but it's not really three-dimensional. In the game world, this is three-dimensional. So here's what you're going to do. We're going to have to make a pass over and this way. You can watch the frustum, uh, and you'll see the game engine adjusting the environment. But if you really want to see the magic, you watch the monitors because that's what the camera sees. All right? No, I'm not going to say anything else. Yeah. All right, are you guys ready? I think that's what they said, right? <laughs> so you'll see, you'll see these real world elements and juxtaposition with the fake. One thing I'll tell you this bag against those stairs is pretty good. All right, and go ahead and action. Lou, should I be killing somebody right now? No, you're supposed to be dying. There we go. Oh, I can be dying. Thanks. So is there is there going? If you look at the bookshelf and you look at the stairs, the stairs have that three dimensional feel to them, and you start to see it as it changes, and it all bends and it moves as it would if we were really out there in in that set. And this is the fun of building. It's pretty awesome that I see cameras get better. <laughs> they got real, real quiet. I assume that means that they thought it was new. And now I'm going to tell you something. You guys, Full Sail is. I haven't been here for 20 years just because it's a good job. I've been here because they know how to do it right. I don't know what's going on over there. <laughs> <laughs> 
so we don't have to um, part that we haven't fixed yet. Sometimes <laughs> other pieces creep in. But I will tell you this, the stuff that we're doing, Bryce nailed it. If you want to do a desert, I love Mandalorian, but that is easy peasy. And if you want to do an environment that none of us have ever experienced, so we have no way of knowing if you got it right, that's easy peasy. But when you start doing stuff like this, where, hey, that looks like my basement at home, or that looks like the grocery store that I visit, and we understand those reference points, and we can get the audience to believe it, that's gold. And I have not seen anyone in virtual attempt this level of interface with the real world and the game engine. And this team has really just outshined themselves with being able to do this. Are we good? Is it time? Are I mean, yeah, around? I think we are at 3.03. Oh, yeah, we're past time. All right. Then I guess we'll do one more pass, and then we'll turn on the house lights. There we go. And uh, we'll be around a little bit. If any of you want to come up and ask any of these guys questions, uh, you're welcome to do that. Other than that, let's give our panelists a big hand. Awesome. Somebody want to hit the lights for me, too. Listen, look at Full Sail 1 for times and opportunities that you can come in and be a part of any of the virtual productions we do. We'll always take volunteers to help out. Uh, and usually we have that stuff well, well uh, in advance.